you've seen a change in the economic conditions of your community. Entire neighborhoods are studded with foreclosure signs. Families across the city feel like they're losing their foothold on the American dream. When we talk about the plummeting home prices and soaring foreclosure rates, we're not just talking about faceless numbers. We're talking about families. Welcome to Lehigh Acres, one of the countless sprawling exurbs and the housing boom that has been drastically reshaped and now the bust is testing whether the experience of shared struggle will pull people together or tear them apart. In Lehigh Acres, homes are selling at 80% off their peak prices. Only two years after there were more jobs than people to work them, fast food chains are laying off people or closing, crime is up, school enrollment is down, and one of four residents received food stamps in December, nearly a four-fold increase since 2006. I lived in Lehigh for 27 years, so I'm, I am very familiar with the community. My son grew up here. It, you know, it was a wonderful community. We never had this type of thing going on here, but, um, but you definitely see the changes. You know, you drive down any street and you see rundown houses now because people, you know, have just moved out, the grass is overgrown. It's, you know, it's sad to see that. So it's um, a sign of the times. It was like Armageddon was gonna happen. There was just, did you have a two year balloon? Three, four, five because it's all going to get whacked. Instead of I'm going to buy this house and stay here for 40 years, their perception changed a little bit to I'm going to buy this house and stay here for a couple years and then I'll buy a bigger one and I'll stay there for a couple years and I'll buy a bigger one and I'll stay there for a couple years. People who wouldn't normally have any experience in real estate investing were speculating on the fact that all they had to do was buy something, hold it for a brief period of time and suddenly they would they would receive windfall profit. Yep, everybody was gonna make a fortune. And when the music stopped, a lot of people didn't. Nobody was predicting a, a crash. I didn't see anybody say, well, this thing's overheated. They didn't say that until the Doherty burst. And then they said, well, you know, this is, couldn't last forever. It, it, it was just a feeding frenzy. Uh, Unbelievable, and, a very, and the consequences have been very sad for a lot of people. But as far as me you know, working, it, it was just, it was a boom and I was working, making money. You know? No, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> it's all over. Yeah. Our many years of expertise in the Florida market has led us to secure a limited inventory of the very finest properties available anywhere. And best of all, our staff has been able to secure these properties at a fraction of the current market value. Now we have concentrated our efforts in only those areas that have shown phenomenal growth in the past and still offer tremendous opportunities for the future. Now one such area is Florida's Lower West Coast and specifically Lee County recognizes the fastest growing county in the United States of America today. On the eastern border of Lee County sits a section of select prime residential property known as Lehigh Acres. Let's take a closer look at this unique area. My whole life with the uh, Lehigh Acres actually began by meeting uh, Jerry Gould in the Roney Plaza swimming pool in Miami Beach years ago. <laughs> I had just moved to Florida. I was looking for a date 
and Myra was in the swimming pool. She was very cute. And so I jumped in the pool and swam over to her and got the conversation. I said, what are you doing for dinner? And she said, I'm sorry, I'm going with somebody. Jerry became friends with Lee Ratner. And Lee Ratner had all the land here in Lehigh. He had a company called Decon, which was a rodenticide. And he had taken a, a product that was being sold for 79 cents for a box of this product, advertised it, and changed the name, sold it for buck 69, and captured 85% of the rodenticide market in the United States. So he was a brilliant marketer. He and I had become so friendly, we used to go horseback riding together at his ranch, which was the Lucky Lee Ranch over in Lee County. We'd fly over in his plane, land on the property. There was an airstrip which he had built. And we chased cows all day, having fun. The late Lee Ratner was a fantastic man. And Jerry actually came up with the idea of saying, you know, you've got a lot of land here. This would be a great place for a development. One day he said to me, you know, I'm going to have to sell the ranch. And I said, why? He said, well, because they've changed the tax law and you can't deduct it from your taxes. And I have no reason to want to be a cowboy. It's just that I was using it as a tax shelter. And I said, well, we would divide it up in lots and sell it in lots. So that's what we did. We formed a company. And that's how the Acres got started. I started working uh, uh, in the advertising and sales promotion department, uh, writing letters to, to customers. In those early days, there were maybe uh, you know, 2,500 people here. Um, there was one road, two lanes, that was it. Um, not, not a whole lot of anything else. And so when they were searching for what are we going to name this place, um, Acres was always kind of a lovely thing to talk about, you know. So Lee High Acres, the highest point in Lee County, and yet our advertisements in the early days uh, showed uh, uh, me standing in Lehigh and waving to my wife who was in the Gulf of Mexico boating just right over there. And uh, for $10 down and $10 a month, you could be that close to. It. <laughs> In those early days, uh, did all sorts of ludicrous things to get people interested in spending their money buying a lot in beautiful downtown sunshiny Lehigh Acres. Took a couple of good looking women with bikinis in the middle of the snowstorms in shopping centers up north and invited people to come and, and look at the traveling house. We'd get an elephant, uh, the elephant would walk around the shopping center had two great big signs on it, you could fly to Florida for peanuts. And that's the early days. They were fun. Working for them was great. I mean, uh, what they would do, they would solicit vacationers from all over the state of Florida. And they would bring busloads of people. They would solicit them and say, we're going to take you over to a, a new community that's being built. Uh, it's not going to cost you no money. There's no charge for the tour. We're going to give you a nice tour share a nice community, give you a free breakfast and a free lunch and a bag of tomatoes or, or oranges. And if you like what you see, you might participate. If you don't, no obligation. So they would bring in maybe 15, 20 bus loads a day at 10, 12 couples per, per bus. So that would mean maybe 150 to 180 customers a day. The ones that bought went home in one bus. The ones that didn't buy went back to Miami in another. <laughs> so we didn't want anyone to discourage <laughs> the other group from not buying. I'm sure their whole motive was cutting up all this land into the smallest tiny pieces they could and selling it to as many people for $10 down and $10 a month. I remember going to Wisconsin one time and doing a party up there and literally asking people to hold up a $10 bill over their head. And I plucked the $10 from them and then congratulated them on buying land in Florida. <laughs> and 
and uh, it was crazy in those days. A lot of times you go to like a, a gas station or a hotel and it said, fill in this form and uh, you can win a four day, three night vacation in Florida. Well, guess what? Everybody was a winner. Everybody was a winner because they fill in the form and guess what? They get a call on the phone and said, you're the lucky winner. When would you like to come to Florida? There was no uh, governing body back in those days that controlled what land developers did. So uh, we did a lot of strange stuff. In the early days, a salesman would drive them out to the woods. They'd stand on the top of the car and they would point and say, your lot's just right over there. Well, I guess if you could see seven or eight or nine or ten miles, it would be just right over there. It, it, it was kind of funny because I had these things in different offices to add credibility to the scam that we were not scam. That's not a scam. <laughs> we sold 12,000 lots the first year. So when you ask us how quickly did it become successful, immediately. People like Bill and Betty Lundquist, they're now proud to call Lehigh home. They moved here about five years ago from up north after vacationing in Florida. After our first vacation to Southwest Florida, Betty and I just knew we had to live here someday. The environment, it's so healthy, it's wholesome, and we knew it reflected our values. When we found Lehigh and saw all that it offered us, we knew it was the right time and place. So when they buy the lot, I don't, you know, you could have, I tell them up front, you have no credit, good credit, bad credit, unemployed, bankrupt, social security, escape from jail, witness protection program, you qualify. And the reason is because you can't put the land in a truck and drive the land to Tampa. The land will be here tonight, tomorrow night, the next night. Lots finally sold in Lehigh for fifty and sixty thousand dollars a piece. The banks were lending thirty thousand dollars on it. You know how much you can get for a lot today? Maximum five thousand bucks. That's maximum. The banks are negative twenty-five thousand dollars. I thought this will never end. You know, I had no reason to believe it wouldn't. But I knew in 2006, 2007, I could see the handwriting on the wall with these, uh, with these people buying houses with, with zero down. That doesn't work. I ran a little test about uh, maybe 10 years ago, 12 years ago. I ran an ad in the newspaper, in the Fort Myers News Press. No money down, no payments for 90 days, $50 a month. I sold 22 lots. You know how many people paid me on the fourth month? Zero. Zero. No money down. No payments for 90 days. $50 a month on the fourth month. Zero. You have to have the money to buy the property. You would think one person would have had the money. One. People were encouraged on television to take money out of their homes and buy something. Everybody had a credit card to sell you. Everybody said take out an equity line. Everybody said consolidate your debt, buy something else. <clears throat> and I thought, you know, that's kind of peculiar because I, I grew up where you saved your money, bought a house, and you really defended your house. You didn't want to take anything out of it. You were always trying to find a way to. Uh, but I didn't think much about it until it crashed. And then I thought, gee, you know, we. We had the perfect financial storm. Opportunities like Lehigh don't come along every day, and I hope you'll take advantage of this one. I know you'll be glad you did. Saturday and Sundays we come out here to sit, play Scrabble and try and sell this house. <laughs> what are you asking for it now? 69.9. And 
Any idea how much it might have been uh, during the boom, the height? About $250,000 probably. She was a friend of mine that had the house and um, she probably, she bought it in about 82, 1982 and probably paid 69.9 for it at that time. That's sad. Yeah, yeah, she bought it fully furnished. There's no longer any furniture that goes with it. Years ago, you know, we're $2,500 to buy a lot out here. They went up to, you know, forty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000, you know, during the boom. Now, probably $2,500 again. People who knew who, you know, were the true investors know when, but they know what to look for when to get out. I mean, because that's, that's how they make it. We used, we used to comment, you know, you drive by all these new, um, new condos and developments and everything and think, where, where are all these people getting all this money? You know, to, to do that, and, and as soon as they build them, they'd, they'd fill them up as fast as, you know, they, as they were built, they'd they were, be filled out. They were buying out. dirt as it was being, you know, I mean. You Getting on waiting list, you yeah. know, to get into uh, you just projects. Couldn't, you couldn't get, you, the people couldn't be down here fast enough to get what was going on. It was, it was just amazing. People were buying four or five homes thinking they could flip them before the market, uh, you know, before there was any consequences. We had people telling folks you can buy uh, now and we, you'll never make a mortgage payment because somebody will pay for it. Uh, we'll, you know, you'll sell it. So it was just nuts. There was a time when typically on, a, on any given day, five new homes were being started. Um, now you get 15 in a month and everyone says, well, that's pretty good. <laughs> a lot of these sitting for sale and these aren't small homes. Some of these are huge. Here's one, never finished. The world of speculation went from low to medium all the way up to stratospheric. When units are being created at a rate that exceeds the growth coming into the area at its best and highest growth period, you're still building more units and people that are moving in, that doesn't make sense. Uh, and that's clearly where we were. If you were anywhere related to construction or financing or real estate, um, there was plenty of work. And, and great opportunity in the mid-2000s. Uh, so that money was coming in so you could afford to buy a house. When the construction business stopped, they couldn't pay the mortgages anymore, so they rented. When they couldn't pay the rent anymore, they moved. As bigger banks started to have difficulties and, and uh, late payments and foreclosure rates started to increase, um, it was, that was the, uh, the telltale sign you know, that the market had totally changed. This is something that was all set up and was going to have lots of these luxury homes on this nice big lake. And it's been sitting like this for a long time. Kind of, if you remember Back to the Future, what was they called it? Lion's Gate. Bella Vista at Kismet Lakes. Now it's Bella Nothing. It finally reaches a point where there's nobody that's going to pay this inflated price. And when there's nobody to pay for it, you're stuck with it. My name is Melinda Pinsinger. I'm a CPA. I work for a public accounting firm in Fort Myers. And I was an owner of a coffee shop in Lehigh Acres, the LA Cafe and Coffee House, until November of 2008. I was driving home from Fort Myers where I worked and thinking that we needed a place like a coffee shop in Lehigh. There was nothing like that in Lehigh. So knowing that I had equity in the house, I decided to, to do that. And I researched for about two and a half years and opened in January of 2008. My feeling was that if the coffee shop didn't go as planned, the worst it could get, I would have to sell the house so I could pay off the equity loan. Um, the first house I bought in Lehigh Acres, I bought in 2002. I was there for two years. I bought this one in 2004. At one point it was appraised at $290,000. That was in 2006. In November it appraised at 140, and now it's down to 79.9. It, every time I have someone look at it, it's lower. <laughs> I had to make a choice at one point whether I was gonna try and keep my house or keep the business going because I, could, I didn't have enough credit to keep making payments on both of them and I couldn't get more credit. So I decided to stop making the payments on the house and try and save the business. But then because I wasn't making house payments, the credit card companies, even my business credit card companies, started 
to increase my rates, even though I was paying them every month on time. And I got notice from one that they were going to increase my rate to 33% unless I wrote them a letter by a certain day, which I did. And they closed my account because of writing that letter. But then when I tried to negotiate the rate lower when they raised it anyway, they said my account was closed. I, I owe about three times um, what the house is worth now. The abandoned homes and the economy being the way it is, huge uptick in crime. For a while, the air conditioners, even from homes that were being lived in, they would just come back at the end of the day and no air conditioner left outside. They were stolen for the copper tubing. The police were, have been there many, many times. DEA and FBI all surrounded the house. There was quite a scene one night. Next thing you know, people were gone and no one's taking care of it. 2000, the house I lived in sold for $45,000. Three, four years ago, they wanted $210,000 for that house. You know, it's still for sale. Half of these houses that are for sale or more than half of them are in here or foreclosures. I'm in, I'm in the middle of it, watching all these deeds being record, recorded. We're having a, just an unbelievable time trying to keep up in the official records with all the mortgages and deeds and everything. Mortgage foreclosures two years ago for the for we had 3,500 3, filed for the first seven months of our fiscal year. Last year we had 15,061 for the same time period. That's October through April. This year we had a mere 14,625. So it's down 3% from last year and uh, it's still up 313% from two years ago. My name is Maggie Gonzalez and I live in Cape Coral, Florida. In January 1st is when we renew our lease for 2009. Well, the landlord or manager came to the household to tell us that the owner had stopped paying the house uh, in September of 2008. The manager said that the owner was using our rent money to pay for lawyers. And we get this in the mail for one month. Next month, same document, still same thing in the mail, saying that the house is going under foreclosure. And another one. And another one. This was actually the first one. And then this is our actual August lease. I was actually very worried that the bank would just come, you know, someone would come to our door and say, all right, well, you got 30 days to move out, you know? So that's what I'm worried about. If we move out, it's, it's like a jungle out there because there's so many people in our same situation that are looking for a roof over their heads to live and, you know, it's hard since there's so many of us to find a place to live. I've never, ever seen anything in the 60-some uh, years I've been here that, that I've ever seen anything like that. It's just outrageous what happened for about five years. We knew that the property wasn't valued at that. We being the realtors, our community knew that uh, things were overpriced. We knew that there was going to be a, a huge correction. Um, we also know that it's going to go back. It won't go back to 217. Um, it will be there, um, but it won't be there in the morning. 
Um, on the business side, we have seen a pickup in business. Um, the sophisticated investors decided that prices are low enough where you can buy a house for $50,000 that would cost you $120,000 to build. Uh, or 140,000 to build, they're coming in and they're buying them in large numbers. I could tell you that if you talk to any realtors today, they'll tell you that they're writing the same number of contracts as they've ever written, probably more. The difference is the size of the contract. Um, I'm writing 65, 70, 80,000 dollar contracts, where two years ago I was writing 217,000 dollar contracts for the exact same property. Well, I can tell you that prior to the boom, there were about six real estate companies in Lee Acres. Uh, during the boom, there were 40. Now there's probably back down to five or six. And, and I can tell you the reason why is the companies that were here before and, and that didn't participate in getting buyers into houses beyond what they could afford, those are the companies that have repeat referral customers. Um, not that we didn't participate in it. I'm not saying that everybody is uh, guilty and we're innocent. But I am saying that um, it, if you saw it coming, you, you didn't put people in homes they couldn't afford. We know there are people hurting in this community right now, and our network of nonprofits, whether it's churches or um, nonprofits, have really come together to bring services to people and make sure they know what services are available to get them through this economic time. I see the the that the community of Lehigh Acres is actually has taken this opportunity to take a stand and to make sure we know exactly who we are and that we're not a slum. I got a call from a national publication said your traffic citations are down. Why are they down in Lee County and throughout Florida, Charlie? And my first reaction was we're much better drivers than we were. But the truth of the matter is there's not as many cars on the road. And not only are our traffic citations down, but our felony cases are down, our misdemeanor cases are down. All our cases except foreclosure are down. And that's because a whole segment of our population, all these people that were helping to build all these properties, construct all these homes, put up all these condominiums, build all this community, got up and left. They went within an eight month period of time, they were gone. And when they left, they took, they took a lot of the crime with them. A lot of the stuff that we had went with them. And they also left behind properties that just said, well, I can't pay it, so they left. One of the things that troubles me a little bit is we are seeing the institutional investor come back into the real estate market. This is not the speculator of before. These are well-heeled, deep pocket groups of people or companies that are coming in and buying the property that's being foreclosed upon but they're not homeowners. And so ultimately, while they help us in the short term soak up some of this excess inventory, they prolong the recovery because as soon as the market starts to recover, they will take and put those houses right back on the market again. We went from a society that didn't think anything about borrowing to a society that can't borrow. Uh, for whatever reason, the banks aren't lending, the, their credit's ruined. So we're going to go to a more cash society. We're going to probably depend more on our local banks again. And we're going to reinvent how we do business. And I think that's probably a very strong uh, underpinning for us to carry forward. I got the forbearance, but my credit card companies are still increasing my rates. And so I don't know if I'll be able to hang on. Right now I'm listing it for a short sale. It was, um, the comps are that it's worth $79,900, so I owe $250,000. <laughs> the other side of foreclosure is that people that could never buy a house three years ago, four years ago, five years ago, now have the ability to step in and buy a property. I have moved 36 times in my life, and the last thing I want to do is move again. So I, I was sitting in the couch one night, I said, hey, let's buy the house. You know, we are hearing on the news, houses for eighty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000, you know, why not? We're so settled here with my, you know, with my family that why not just try to purchase the house? So we actually went, my aunt is a mortgage broker and my cousin is a realtor, so we 
in Miami, so she got us all prepared with all the paperwork and we put an offer to the owner and an offer to the bank since the house is now a short sale. And we're just running around in circles getting the paperwork in order. I would say for uh, at least five years, things ought to be on a more even keel because uh, the economy has to finish turning around and people have learned a lesson. But how long will that lesson last? Usually memories are pretty short. And I'd say 20 years from now, if the opportunity existed, <laughs> same thing would happen again. Uh, we'll get back to a normal, stable market where we have you know, about the same number of buyers and sellers and back to modest appreciation where we should be. Uh, but we're on the right track. We've been here for 33 years. We're gonna be here for hopefully 33 more. That's the way we work. We'll be back in the boom, uh, and, I, and I know we will. Uh, hopefully I'll be retired playing golf more often, enjoying the good life. <laughs> People say, oh, you moved here from Miami Beach? And I said, well, I never regretted it because uh, it was a wonderful place, and I, feel that it still is.